All right, let's get some more analysis on this huge story by speaking to Sarah Webb. She's in Melbourne, Australia. She's an astrophysicist, astrophysicist sorry, and a PhD candidate at Swinburne University. Okay, uh, Ms. Webb, thanks very much for being with us again. So just first off, before we talk about how um, incredible and interesting it is that this uh, test flight has launched, just explain to us how challenging it is to fly something in the Martian atmosphere. Right. So it is insanely challenging, probably more challenging than most people even realize, because not only is Mars, um, it doesn't have as much atmosphere as us, which I think most of us appreciate, but the actual density of the air that is there is about 1% of what is here. Um, so trying to generate uh, upward lift, which is what planes and helicopters do with their propellers and jet systems, is really difficult when you don't have a lot of stuff in the air to push down to be able to generate your lift. Um, not only that, it's freezing cold. So Mars, uh, where, where this a craft is positioned, has been having temperatures of negative 60 degrees um, during nighttime. Uh, so it can get incredibly cold, which means for electronics and also for moving parts, there's the danger of um, either freezing, completely ruining the electronic circuits um, or uh, degrading the actual metal parts within certain spacecraft. So that is something that that is another challenge as well. So it was difficult, but they achieved it, which is... Uh good credits to them. Now, just explain the applications sure then of do. this technology going forward. They've managed to fly it for 40 seconds, but obviously they want to fly it for longer and maybe bigger craft too. That's right. Um, so this is a bit like the Wright Brothers' uh, first plane ride, but in 2021, it's NASA this time, and on another planet. And so it really is a test because... Um, as we can see, it, it worked, thankfully, which is wonderful. Uh, but there was always a possibility that perhaps it wouldn't work. And so um, part of the experimentation is testing what are the limitations of the current build and is it able to travel in you know, different directions at different heights, different speeds, being able to optimise its design. Uh, so then in the future, for future missions to come, being able to put science instruments on these type of probes so you can fly into a crater drill a hole, grab a sample. Um, you'll be able to do so much more excavation and, and collection scientifically um, with craft that are able to fly like, like a drone or like a helicopter. Uh, and just lay out for us then why it is so important to try and get around uh, these planets when we do land on them. Of course, we sort of see the pictures in the particular area where the craft lands, and I guess they get around a few kilometres in that area. But how important is it to really see as much of the planet as possible for our scientific knowledge? Right, that's an excellent question. Um, so you can imagine if we were to just plonk, like plonk someone down on Earth in a random place, that the few kilometres around them would not be representative of what the whole planet has to offer. Say, you know, I'm from Australia, we get a craft and put it in the middle of Australia, we would think Earth was barren and no water, inhabitable, a desert, um, where that's not true. And the same happens for if we're exploring other planets. If you put a craft in a certain area that might not have um, the the resources or the type of things that you're looking for, it does. it's not representative of the whole planet. And we know that Mars is a very diverse um, geophysical system where we have, uh, you know, past lakes and rivers that we know water probably ran there and we know that there is water underneath the ice pole caps and so there's a lot of different areas where exploration would be fantastic however being able to land there uh, is quite challenging on the on, on you've only got one shot so being able to land exactly where you want is is challenging so you want to land somewhere that is a safe zone um, and, but by having craft like this it will limit the the possibility of landing somewhere that is more dangerous for the touchdown and could result in loss of equipment, whereas you can land in a safer option, uh, not near massive craters, and then be able to fly to to where you would like to be. Okay, and just finally, much more convenient. Oh, oh, definitely, much more convenient to fly uh, as anyone <laughs> who's been stuck in traffic will tell <laughs> you. Now, I, I do wonder if you can feed our imagination somewhat. Then, of course, we've been to Mars. Now we're looking for ancient microbial life, but there are other planets out there that have sort of good prospects as being what scientists call, I understand, the Goldilocks zone, where there could be more life. Just tell us where do you think would be next in the decades to come where humans look for uh, life outside of our planet? Right. Uh, so that's completely correct. At the moment, we're looking in the Goldilocks zone, so this happy little area where Earth, Mars and Venus live, where water can exist 
that, that we know of. However, if we go out a little bit further to Jupiter and Saturn, even though it is much colder out there, you get a lot less sunlight, the moons that Jupiter and Saturn have have incredibly unique properties. Um, so these moons are able to be thermal, thermally heated by the, the massive mass of the planets, which means that liquid water can exist under the crust of these moons. Um, and from here on Earth, we know where there is water, there is life. Um, and life is very persistent here on Earth. We're able to find microbes and uh, small celled organisms living in some of the most challenging places that you would not expect. Um, and so there is no reason why uh, the possibility that microbes could form in other challenging regions in our solar system. Um, there's no reason why that doesn't exist. And being able to find that is, I think, a very exciting thing for the next few decades. Absolutely. Something that will be addressed eventually. Yeah, definitely a very exciting time for space exploration. Okay, Sarah Weber, the astrophysicist from Swinburne University in Australia. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.